from Governor Saludo's salary claims to helping Haiti to northern states protected by terrorists, there are very few topics my next guest hasn't weighed in on. These ones I shared with you are just in the past few days, and he has the right and the pedigree to do so. Just that today he promises to be as vocal when we talk about his former colleagues in the Senate and this budget padding story. The upsurge in school abductions, mistakes of the Buhari administration, state police, the sim blockers who somehow can't block ransom collectors, the Italian mafia, and something about shekels of silver, as well as other issues we'll be addressing in this exciting hour. Hello and welcome to Political Paradigm on Channel's television. I'm Kayla Magua. My guest is known by many names. Comrade, Quamred revolutionary, Megashi. He has been called many names, but one name he can never be called is Shai. Join me in welcoming to the program Senator Shehu Sani. He was a senator representing Kaduna Central from June 2015 till June of 2019. This Kaduna-born politician is currently a member of the People's Redemption Party. He's also an agricultural engineer, civil rights activist, Pan-Africanist, freedom fighter, author, publisher, and poet. He's the current president of the Civil Rights Congress of Nigeria. Mr. Shehu Sani, welcome to Political Paradigm. Thank you for having me in this It's program. really, really nice to, to have you on the program. Happy Ramadan. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about a few of the things going on right now, because you have been very vocal about them. But you see, the thing is, you're very vocal on social media. Why, why did you decide to do that? Because I know that for many people, myself included, I'm pretty shy on social media. But you're very vocal. What made you decide to use that platform? Uh, thank you for having me in your program. Well, um, for decades and for the most part of our lives, uh, we have been intervening on national issues as far as expressing our views or opinion is concerned. And that is part of our own ideals. And it didn't start today. And that has been uh, our vocation since the time of military rule. And that has in many times uh, got us into trouble over the years. Uh, things have evolved. And in today's world, uh, the only platform from which you can easily hear your opinion, and it radiates to those that need to hear it in the social media. And uh, many of us have embraced it uh, with all its uh, challenges, troubles. Let's talk about those challenges. Yes. Because that's one of the issues people have. Many people have called for the regulation of social media because of fake news and just how toxic it can be. You know, especially for people who are trying to preach mental health and, you know, trying to see if we can have a sane society. Maybe people have called for the restriction of social media, at least its coordination in some sort, to reduce the toxicity and to ensure that only real stories are put out there. What do you make of these calls? Well, you see, like uh, in everything in life, uh, when you have the positive side, there is the negative side. Before the advent of social media, people find it difficult to assess the news. You have to wait till the next morning to go to the vendor and, and get what is happening. Or you have to wait for a week uh, for the periodicals that usually come up on Sundays or Mondays. But today, as things are happening, so you are also involved. As they said, now uh, the information follows you. You don't follow the information. But the problem we have is that it is becoming chaotic, actually. And many people couldn't stand the heat. When I was in the National Assembly, and up to today, I can say that 80% uh, of people in government are not in social media. And they are not in social media, not that they don't access and harvest information from there, but many don't actually operate their social media handles uh, for the fact that many can't tolerate they can't contain, they can't uh, condone the kind of toxicity that comes with it. You post something positive and then you expect uh, either uh, contributions 
or responsible commentary, you can get insult out of it. So it has generated so many things and it has taken a life of its own. But the danger of regulation is that people are not regulating. Uh, in the past, there were attempts by the National Assembly session I belong to and the subsequent one to regulate the social media. But it has uh, come with a lot of uh, risk. The risk is the fact that uh, those who were calling for social media regulation are not doing that in, on the platform that it is chaotic, but they see it as one that targets them and hold them accountable. Because it has become a people's parliament where people can hold the government to account. And there are many things that get changed and get government attention simply because it comes from the social media. So you can see, you, if you are going to regulate it, you also be, you have to be careful so that you don't trample on the rights of people to freely express themselves. I think the area that I want, that uh, if there is even need for regulation, is the one in which people should own up to what they have said or they, what they have posted or what they have tweeted on Instagram, Facebook, uh, threads, or, uh, or whatever. Uh, because most fake news comes from anonymous sources. And uh, if you are going to have a Facebook account, there can be a regulation to say that it belongs to you. So whatever information that comes out of it, uh, everyone knows it's from you. So that one is better. But when you are talking of restricting information, I mean, trying to censor uh, people from expressing their opinion, then you have gone against what our constitution has provided and guaranteed for us. I mean, listening to a few of the people, even in this administration, who are talking about some sort of regulation, of course, Mr. Bajabia Miller is one of those voices. They, 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 you listen to them and it also almost comes from, a, well, they, they seem to be coming from a point of view where, look, you're not holding people responsible for putting out, talking about this, the platforms themselves. It's very rare that we find people being held responsible for putting out false stories. Usually what happens is if there's a fake story, we hope that the true story comes out, combats it, and then we're able to get law enforcement to do what's right. But the, the onus in, in their minds is on, should be on the part of those who own these platforms to ensure that people are unable to use their platforms to forward agendas that could be anti-democratic, that could cause chaos, that could cause a lot of you know, anxiety and hatred and, and even sometimes crisis on social media. You know, but, you know... Is there some kind of balance? I listened to your response there. Is there, some, is there some kind of balance that can be made in this regard right now? You see, um, most times when people are in the opposition, they have a set of a template of what they want the society to do and not to do. And the ruling party now has effectively used social media to vilify, to attack, and to demonize uh, the former ruling party, which was the PDP. But the moment uh, we came to power in 2015, then people in the position of authority started becoming uncomfortable with what they did. So it's like uh, what goes round comes round. So the PDP was in power, and we effectively used the social media to demonize them, to destroy them, to evict them out of power. But now the APC came to power, and the same weapons are being used by young people against the APC. And now they now start taking, no, we now need to regulate. But you don't do things because you are in power. You look at the greater good of the society. I accept the fact that there are some social media content that undermines democracy, that threatens the stability and unity of this country. There are some social media content that has the capacity of setting the nation ablaze. But the point is that once we have a system where every uh, person who makes an input, whatever information comes can be traced to that person, you will naturally have regulations. Because... Um, some people simply share fake information. Some post, some create fake information. 
Some create inciting statement and some share inciting statement. So once you have a threat, a, 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 an algorithm where it will say, this is the person who originated the story. People will now be very careful. But I am not in support of a censorship where it will make it impossible uh, for people to hold their government to account or a censorship where it will make people in power so comfortable that the weapon being used against them or the one they used before has now been neutralized. That's supposed not to be. I want to be able to get your thoughts on a few of the things that are going on in the country. Of course, you are very vocal on national issues. Um, the restraint in summoning heads of MDAs. We heard the president talking to members of the Senate, your former colleagues, saying exercise some restraint in inviting heads of MDAs. Let them be able to do their job. In fact, it's prompted some kind of social media buzz right now. Let the heads of MDAs breathe, so to speak. What do you make of that? Do you, do, you, do you agree with the president on that? Are they being summoned so much so that they're unable to focus and get their job done? Yeah, you see, um, I will agree in some ways because you can have one head of MD being invited every day from Monday to Friday. Uh, a head of MD can be invited by the Senate committee uh, on the, on the banking, he can be invited by Senate committee on public accounts. He can be invited by Senate committee on public uh, on, 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 on appropriation. He can be invited by Senate committee on transport. So when he is done with that, he will have another invitation from the House of Reps. So sometimes in a day, they attend like three to four uh, summons, and any attempt by any one of them not to attend any of these summons. Uh, it may attract bad blood between that head of ND, MD and the, and the Senate or the reps. Now, the president is somehow right in that aspect. But I think it's not for the president to do that. It is for the Senate president and speaker. It has been the tradition or the culture since 1999 for head of MDAs to be indiscriminately invited. But now, this one here, I have the opportunity to say that we will now create a template on how head of MDAs can be invited. Uh, before you invite any head of MD, you must make sure that there is no other committee within the two uh, arms that invites, invites him. Because when you do that, there should be a portal where these things here are centralized. But now it's, it has been chaotic. So I agree with that. But the fact is that Head of MDAs uh, themselves uh, have a certain culture that many things they do are opaque. And uh, if they uh, want less invitation, uh, then they should be as transparent as possible. So we wouldn't have to get you to explain if it's to actually be clear. Inviting them for to us come to over and, 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 and talk to the National Assembly always, if you are as transparent as possible. But again, the the head of MDAs that always attract the highest invitation are the ones that are said to be lucrative. And MDAs, like revenue generation, uh, generative MDAs, and the ones that have a lot of allocations, they, they are usually invited. But you hardly, there are some that hardly have been called because virtually nothing happens there. I mean, if there's a lot of allocation going somewhere, uh, there's a lot of monitoring. So it's possible that a lot of these places that seem lucrative, as you describe them, well, they, they will require a lot of explaining. Well, for example, now, you can see that um, the head of Public Complaints Commission and Human Rights Commission hardly are invited. But the MD of NNPCL, the, 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 the executive chairman of Israel Revenue, and uh, DG Nimasa, or the DG of Port Authority or the Chairman of Port Authority, you will see them always uh, attending to one event or another. And, and the issue is that um, the president was a senator sometimes in his life, and he knows the way things operate. Does uh, the fact uh, that they are lucrative affect the Senate in any way? Uh, yeah, it, it does, in the sense that money is involved. Do they uh, have to have give any money? Budget, 
They don't so need Senate, to give money, but they also have to make sure that they don't spend unnecessary amount of money or they don't loot money. So what there is money, uh, you have to make sure that it's either it's not looted or you don't overspend it or you don't misuse it uh, or in other ways. But uh, there is something at stake there. So let's talk about something else. Yes. Uh, the student loan bill has been passed, of course, reenacted, so to speak, with the necessary corrections that the president wanted and, and passed. What do you make of the student loan bill? A lot of your followers are students, and uh, it's something many young people we've heard of. I, I used to hear about student loans from across the world, and in, in some way I thought this was a problem. As a, as a young person, I just didn't want anything to do with student loans. But we're introducing that in the country. Is that something that you're in support of? You see, I have a problem with um, the way we want to run our education system. Now, some two days ago, I made a tweet of five most educated African countries. If you look at Zimbabwe, you see uh, South Africa, you see Mauritius, you see Kevad. Look at the literacy rate. It's about 85%, 95%, sometimes 98%. These are countries that have provided free education and are politically left-leaning and committed the resources of their country to educate their people. The problem we have in this country is that we have a double standard. The generation of Nigerian leaders today, from the president to ministers, governors, senators, and people holding position of power, 90 5% of them were beneficiaries of a system that has provided them free education at all levels. Now, we have reached a point where successive governments has allowed our edu public education to simply go down the drain. Many of the schools we attended as pupils, as our students, are schools we cannot take our children to today. I attended Government Science College, Kagara, which is a unity school. Today, that school has been taken over by soldiers since bandits attacked the school three years ago. And go to most of the schools that were attended by people who are now ministers, governors, and uh, senators. They have become a shadow of the schools. If we don't invest in education, we will have a big problem to contend with. Student loan is a beautiful idea, but we should not cage or chain our young ones to loans that if loans work in the United States, because we usually make reference to it, that uh, even the United States, I give a loan to students. Yes, when you are done with school, you have 1,000% chance of getting a job when you're out of school in the United States than here. So you finish school, you have a job, and then you pay your loan. There are people who have graduated over 10, 15 years ago. They are still at home. There are people who are engaged in skill work since they left school, but they still couldn't find their footing. We have not reached such a stage in our socioeconomic development to which we will simply allow uh, capitalist investors to take over our education system. We have the resources to invest in education. We have the resources to provide free education for our people. Now take a look at it. Look at the amount of money that was stolen under the last eight years of Buhari administration. This was a government that quarreled with ASU and said they don't have money to meet up the demand of ASU, as students were out of school for almost eight to nine months. But the money that is currently being speculated to have been looted from CBN is enough to solve the problems of our education. So it's always when it comes to good things that we don't have money. But when looting takes place, you wonder where did this money actually come from? So... Look at the profits that have been made by Nigerian banks, Nigerian oil companies. They say one bank has made a profit 
of 300 billion, of 1 trillion, of 800 billion. Where did they get this money? It's Nigerian money. And what did they do? Did they have a factory where they buy and sell? No. It is government money. Most of these are so-called captains of industry and head of executives of this and that are all dependent on patronage from government. So to me, student loan is good, but the condition should simply be relaxed to such a point that people's lives will not be strangulated after school. You have been a student. You can imagine you have graduated, you don't have a job, but you have always been receiving an alert of a reminder that you need to pay money, which you have collected from 100 level and to 400 level. And interest is building on it. So I don't know how we're, we're going to live. So why don't you graciously, the benefit you got from being a Nigerian citizen and that led you to where you are today, why don't you transfer the same to our young girls? Today, the northern part of Nigeria is facing a serious security challenges. Why? Because we refuse to educate those who are today fighting us. Yes. Speaking of those uh, who needed to be educated, uh, I was going to go to another um, issue that has been addressed by the president recently. The Alamaji Education Commission, Brigadier General uh, Lawal Jafari Issa who was former governor of Kaduna State, where you're from, uh, is going to be heading that uh, commission. What do you make of Alamaji education? I mean, I remember growing up in Kaduna and seeing it work back then, you know, because the idea was they didn't want a lot of young boys just loitering around the streets. So I, conversations were coming about infusing other subjects even into the Alamadri system of education so that I could be at par with people who were in, you know, unity schools at least. What do you make of the Alamadri Commission? Is it, is, it, is it going to solve the problem? Because if we have the, this number of out-of-school children right now and we are going through what we're going through right now, as a country, security-wise, it would one one might want to worry about what the next ten years would be like. Because if that little boy is five years old this year, in ten years' time he'll be fifteen. Is Alamadri education necessary to reduce this problem, especially in the north? Well, um, you see, the problems of uh, Almajri is an economic problem. It's a social problem. It's a religious problem. It's a traditional problem, and it's also a regional problem. Now, in the last 30 years, there were attempts by governments and individuals to address the problems of al -Majiri. I can remember uh, Colonel Usman Jibrin, the former governor of Kaduna State, military governor, has done his best in terms of trying to see how this issue of Almajiri can come to an end, but he couldn't. We have tried all sort of formulas. Formula. There was this formula of arresting the Almajiri and deporting them back to their villages. There was this formula of uh, threatening the teachers of Almajiri. And there is another formula of, of making sure that Almajiri are resettled. All have failed. Well, the question we need to ask ourselves, how does Almajri come about? Come about? And where is the factory that generates this Almajri? For any person who is a Muslim, he knew that there is a specific Islamic sect that subscribes to Almajri, and not all the sect. So, if any plan that does not include bringing that sect to the realization that this is inhuman and cannot be tolerated, and that we need to advance to the 21st century. We cannot allow our young kids roaming in the street in the name of al -Majri. They are neither educated from the Western, in the Western form, and they are, they are also not educated in the, in the Islamic okay. form. Okay. They move about from morning to night, scavenging for food, sometimes engaging in acts of crime. These are young boys. Some are as young as seven, some eight. These are great scientists that we, 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 we have lost. These are mathematicians we have lost. 
These are lawyers we have lost. These are people who are genius. There could be an Albert Einstein among them. There could be Henry Ford. There could be Tess Nikola Tesla among them. These are resources for which our country could have tapped, preserved for its own future. But we have wasted their lives because we refuse to do the needful. The Almagiri Commission is a beautiful idea. But has it been accepted by that very sect? And how much have they done to convince or incorporate those sects into them? How does an Almagiri come into to being an Almagiri? And it comes this way. A parent living in Kazuna, or Sokoto, or Zamfara, or Kano, because most of the Almagiris come from this axis. Will now, who lives in the rural area, will now send his son to Kaduna, where there is a, an Almajri teacher, and hand over to that teacher in custody of that son for him to know, to learn about his religion. That teacher does nothing. He only teaches, and there is no source of income. So he now will depend on that boy to go out and beg and bring money while he teaches him. But the time that is spent in begging is more than the time that is used in learning. That's how al majri comes. So you see them in the dirty clothes, without shoes, looking famished, and some of them are barely, barely toddlers. So the source is a rural area in Kasana, in Zamfara, in Sokoto, or in Kano. You don't see parents living in the cities, like in Kaduna, sending their own children to another city. It is, they come from rural areas. So they will spend the most part of their life begging, scavenging for food, and without even properly educated in an Islamic way. And that sect subscribed to that before 1979. Sheikh Abu Bakr Mahmoud Gumi, the father of the present Dr. Gumi, um, introduced what they call the Izala sect. And he modernized things and Islamic schools were set up and they become like modern schools. They became like modern schools where you can go, wear uniform, attend. Because that, that was the yes. one I met. Yes. Because I was living in Kaduna at yes. the time. So it was when Sheikh Gumi did that, yes. that we now say, thinking, okay, they are trying to modernize it yes. to make them at power with us so they could write common entrance of course. with us at the time. So he introduced Islamia. So Islamia now spread across. But the other sect refused. And it is what we are still battling with today. So the al Majri Commission will have an easy job once it now incorporates those sects, and those sects are meant to understand clearly that we have to move to 21st century, and what you are doing is destroying the lives of these young boys. I think Jafar Issa was governor at the time. At, at, the go at that time, he tried his yes. best. Yeah. He, was governor. he was military administrator, I think, yeah. at the time in Kaduna State, yeah. when this model was so, so it, Yeah, so now um, Jonathan did it, and, but he couldn't uh, go far with it because his government never gone beyond uh, his tenure. And then politics came into bit. The idea was frozen and later revived. So, so you can see how we move. So if, if we're going to solve this problem of uh, al uh our masses that are living in rural areas need to get a message from this sect that this is no more acceptable and that Islamia schools will be set up in all the major cities where these children can now enroll. But they can only enroll and sit there if they will be able to have food to eat. Because they go out to scavenge for food. So this is something which we have to do at a bigger price, but it is important we do it. Do you think Jeff Isa can get this done? Uh, he has the pedigree of uh, a performer, I believe. Um, he was a military governor in Kaduna State, and he has done 
a lot of work and he has introduced a lot of reforms there. And he's a no-nonsense person, though years has catch, catch, catched up with him, mm. caught up with him. But I, I believe that his ideas he used in the 90s uh, can be used here and we can still achieve a lot from his, uh, uh, from his experience. I mean, one of my fondest memories of him was running into him at Caterpillar stores in Kaduna. He, he was that military administration. I used to walk into the supermarket by himself. Of course, yeah. he, he did a lot. Yes, uh, he was, he was that man. Yes. Well, let's watch and see how he handles this assignment given to him by the president. Yes. Now, let's talk about reducing the cost of governance, something that you've been very vocal about. The yes. president is, you know, up the ante, banning public-funded foreign trips for government officials. In addition to, of course, before reducing the number of people who travel with him, is this... Is, is this enough for us to say he's actually tightening his belt? You see, I, I have problems with that. But it is populist enough to say you have banned ministers from traveling for three months. Um, you will get commendation for cutting the cost of governance and uh, it's something that we have been looking up to, that this government need to address the problem of cost of governance because it's too high in a nation that is passing through such painful period and people are suffering. Uh, court of governors need to be uh, adjusted to, to, to reflect the realities of today. But ministers are representatives of government. Uh, Nigeria is not a pariah state. We, are, we belong to a network of nations. There are associations and international organizations which we have signed and which we are paying as members every month. Yeah, join the meetings so, so, by so Zoom. Let, me, let, me, let, me let them join uh, by uh, Zoom. No, 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 no. It's not how things are done. Uh, you can defend and present the interests of your country in, in matters. If we, are, we are, if we have a minister that has to attend uh, a WHO meeting, if you have a minister that has to attend... A, a, a world food program. We have a minister that has to attend uh, other programs of United Nations. Uh, there is nothing wrong with saying him and one aide he'll go or two. That's what's fine. And you cut the, you can trim it to to the relevance of that. But if you ban them for three months, so after three months, are you going to lift it again? So what what have we achieved? Or will you now have a template? to say that from now to the end of your tenure, this will be the template. So it shouldn't be a situation where we say that we'll be paying workers 35,000 for six months after then, then you're on your own. So now you ban them for three months. So within these 90 days, if there are crucial international engagements to which Nigeria has to participate, where the president cannot go, who is going to go? Are we going to remain here and do nothing? It doesn't work that way. Can join electronically. Well, I, I, I don't know how, how serious they will take you. Let's use someone that is, <laughs> interestingly, she's, she's from Kaduna as well. Well, not from, but, you know, we all knew her in Kaduna, the, the, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amna Mohammed. Mm -hmm. She's not everywhere by herself. She has so many engagements. And once the UN or she's expected to be in those meetings, she joins virtually. Or they do a pre-recording and they send. Uh, the president of Rwanda does it, Paul Kagame. He's talking to so many, they say he's going to give the keynote address at an event. He will record the keynote address in his office and they will play it for us wherever it is that we're attending. These are alternatives. I, 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 I don't think you, if we're going to have a, a serious outing in South Korea, in Seoul, South Korea, where nations uh, will open their pavilion to market themselves over an international economic conference. You say you want to be there through Zoom. I, I don't think that's been a serious thing. I, I think we're talking about spending money now. Uh, so the president himself, he said uh, his trips will not be more than 20 people. But we have seen what happened in Qatar. It's more than 20 people. So, so three months, three months is talkism. Have a template. This is how I want things to happen. They can only go when it is extremely important and that this is the amount of money that can be used for such a trip. 
There's nothing wrong with that. We need to be part of the global community. And whichever conference we are attending, you simply have value to add to our country. This is what is just needed. So let's come to one of the biggest stories out there, which you have been very vocal about. I want to be able to pick your brain on it very, very seriously. This whole budget padding saga. List, well, at least reading your tweets, it seems as though you agree that there has been budget padding going on over the years. Is, am I correct in assuming this? Yes. So how is it done? And, and f when you were in the Senate, was this happening? Was budget padding happening while you were there? Well, um, it's important for uh, everyone watching this program to listen carefully about padding. Uh, budget padding is as old as the history of Nigeria's National Assembly. A recent one being from 2015, 1999 to date. Uh, what is padding? Padding comes in two ways. Uh, but the most important element of padding is that it involves tempering, adjusting, or escalating the figures in the budget submitted by the executives. Lawmakers are not supposed to prepare budgets. Budget is an exclusive preserve of the executive. So they present it before the National Assembly. There is nothing wrong if a road will cost 10,000 naira. And after going through it as lawmakers, and then you say this road should not be more than 5,000 naira. But pardon is when on paper it's 10,000, and after adjustment it is 25,000. So there are two ways pardon happen. The first stage of pardon is about increasing the cost of projects. A minister comes into, or head of parasasa, come to the National Assembly with a budget of 10,000 naira. After the scrutiny of the National Assembly, by the time the budget returns to him, it has been bloated to 50,000 naira. It has become so pregnant with many children, inside it, babies. That is one stage of pardon. The second stage of pardon is in certain projects that are not in the original budget brought by head of MDAs. And I said it in my last tweet. A head of Parastatal said he wants to buy three buckets for his agency. And then the lawmakers add 16 buckets for him. That is insertion. Or they will add shovel and digger and mats and chairs to his own budget, which he never requested for. And in such a way that he cannot raise an alarm out of fear of what may happen to him. Because any head of parastatal that tries to confront the National Assembly members or lawmakers, he will have himself to blame. So it's a situation where you have two wrongs. First of all, the head of parastatals are not saints and the lawmakers are not angels. So these ones will cook their own budget and the moment a lawmaker saw that the budget was cooked, he will add his own soup on top of it. So one is not an angel, the other one is not a saint. So you have two crooks now working on a budget. You have a crooked budget by two. So you, head of parastatal that comes to the National Assembly, you know very well that the cost of that project is supposed to be 10000 And then you put 13000 there. So when the lawmakers saw that you have increased 3000 there, then they will help you to increase another 3000 It becomes 6000 So you can't raise an issue because you knew that you had added 3000 there. So, so budget padding has been there for a long time. But it only comes a controversy when someone tries to blow the whistle. 
So what happened in, in the last uh, 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 case? Hold on. Before Ningi Son, last year, about 206 billion was added to was padded into Nigeria's budget. And there was exchange of words between the Minister of Mediterranean Affairs, the Minister of Finance, and the National Assembly. At the end of the day, the three, the tripod, come to report to Nigerians that it was a clerical error of 206 billion, and nobody followed up whether that has been corrected or not. In the case of Ningi, if you're a senator of a federal republic, a distinguished senator, if you want to blow a whistle, you should be armed with facts. Especially a whistle that when you blow will affect the character, reputation, and integrity of your own colleagues. I had that experience when I was in the National Assembly. As a member of the civil society, as a civil rights activist before I went to the Senate, we have been in the forefront of campaigning for a transparent National Assembly. We have been insisting that the lawmakers should tell us what they are adding. Now I found myself in the National Assembly, and I was stuck in between the rock and the hard place. If I keep quiet, I refuse to reveal, I will come under pressure from my civil society constituency. If I reveal, I will come under serious problem, going to get into serious problem with my colleagues in the National Assembly. Because since 1999, no senator, no member of the House of Reps had, has, had ever disclosed the amount of money being paid to legislators. So as a senator, I took it upon myself to disclose that I received an allot of 13.5 million and that a salary of 750,000 in an interview I gave, and it became viral. But I nearly earned a suspension in the Senate. But I said it because I was armed with fact, because I have the alert to show any person. But in the case of Ningi, if he has raised the issue of padding, he must be able to prove it. But, because if you don't prove it, there will be sanction on you. But sanction against a senator has a laid down procedure. The Senate must agree that their reputation has been crossed. A committee should be set up to invite the senator who raised the allegation to come and provide evidence and proof. And then the committee will now recommend back to the general house that this is what we have found and this is the sanction or the senator has tell the truth. But in this case, uh, the senator issue was raised before in the chamber, contributions were made, and he was automatically suspended. So I don't know how they are able to achieve that. And I'm trying to speak to um, Akpabio to know the formula they use, because it's like um, uh, mathematics. You can't just go to the answer. You have to you have a formula to use, and then you have procedure, and then you reach the answer. So in this aspect of Senator Ningi, he must prove that a pardon took place. Do you think he's going to say anything anymore? Uh, well, it all depends. For now, I think he is on his own. He's on suspension. Yeah, he's on suspension. And that he does not have the support of the Northern Senators, because by this time, if I'm in support of Ningi, I will come up public and say, but they have allowed him to stew in his own juice. So this is now he's alone. Well, he, re he resigned as the head of the Northern Senators Group. And I know Mr. Yaradwa was the person that took over after him. This, so, is, this is what I'm saying that... So um, does it mean that they, they don't agree with him? Or is, or is everyone just protecting themselves for now? Um, you see, if any senator in the National Assembly today over this issue of pardon, it's either on the side of Ningi or you're on the side of Opabio. And those who kept quiet uh, are, have kept quiet for two reasons. Uh, it's either they are afraid of sanction, that they may also be suspended, or 
they simply kept quiet so as not to escalate the problem. But I can see that as things are now, the options for Senator Ningi are three. One is for him to uh, stay the course and serve his full suspension. Second is for him to go to court and challenge his suspension and that no senator can suspend another senator by law. Uh, third is to reach a middle ground where delegations from both sides can meet and solve the problems politically and they move on as colleagues and shake hands and then move on. But these are the only two things that he can do for now. Three things. I think he's going to uh, do three the, things, I, mean. I think he's going to do the last one. Yes. Well, I hope so. But I know that he's not a person who will ever apologize for what he has said. There were a few things that you talked about recently. I'll get to them shortly. This upsurge in the kidnappings in schools across northern Nigeria with, with, with a situation where the, 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 the education sector is already suffering. There was already an existing problem. And now the fear of going to school because you're going to be abducted. You said recently that there are two northern states that are protected from bandits and terrorist attacks. Talk to us a bit about that. And what states are these? And, and, and what do you make of these, this upsurge in kidnappings in the north? Well, first of all, it's important that we appreciate that uh, comparatively to what, has hap what had happened under the Buhari administration, that uh, things are relatively better today, despite the kidnapping. Um, Kaduna Abuja Road used to record not, more than, not, not less than two or three kidnappings every day, but since the last nine months, only one incidence of an attack in Katari village here. And despite the fact that uh, kidnapping is going on in Kaduna, but I can see that about 90% of schools in Kaduna are now being protected by the military, the police, and other security agencies. And that's why you don't see kidnapping happen on our local government and school. But students are still going to school. And that is something to uh, celebrate or to appreciate. Now, um, with regards to the issue that you have raised, I can say that if we are going to address, I think you're talking about addressing the problem with kidnapping. Yes, right? the upsurge in kidnapping. Yes. So if we are going to address the problem of this upsurge in kidnapping, uh, I think we have to use a lot of technology because it's still unimaginable that uh, kidnappers will abduct about 200 people, not 20 people, and then they will be able to move from one point to another without being detected. It's something we need to ask ourselves. I mean, not to, not to cut you short, but the question that many people have, how, how, how was this? If 200 people stepped into Channel's television at one time, <laughs> there wouldn't be space in this studio if 200 people stood yeah, yeah. in this place here. So how, how were you able to move them yeah. from one place to the other? Are there no security operatives? It's not true. There are security operatives. There are checkpoints all over the north. So, so what, how, how were so many people be able to be picked up at the same time? Many people don't believe that these are actual kidnappings going on because it's so many and incredulous. Well, uh, kidnapping has been going on uh, in this country in the last one decade. And uh, since Chibok, uh, we have had a series of kidnapping in school. Chibok happened 10 years ago, then it followed by Dabchi. Then government secondary school Gankara was attacked, students were kidnapped. Government uh, secondary school uh, Jengibe was attacked, students were kidnapped. Federal government girls college Yauri was attacked, students were kidnapped. Bethel Baptist High School was attacked, students were kidnapped. Greenfield University was attacked, students in Kaduna was attacked, students were kidnapped. Uh, Federal School of Forestry Mechanization students were, uh, was attacked, students were kidnapped. Government Science College, Kagara, United States, was attacked, students were kidnapped. We have attack that had happened in Gidangwea in southern Kaduna, and then Kaduna State Polytechnic. These were all attacks that happened in different places at different times. Even Sangaya School in Tegina, in United States. All these are on record that happened. So, where was the problem? Well, the problem has to do with lack of prompt response by our security agencies. Because how you are able to move 200 people out of a certain point 
to their own, to dense dens of terrorists without being detected. I think it's only our security agencies that will be able to, to answer that. Now, the strategy of the kidnappers is that before they attack a school, they study the environment very well. Uh, their first is, after the abduction, they will naturally subject the abductees to kilometers of trekking in the bush. And when they are exhausted, they will now divide them into clusters on motorbikes. And they shift them mostly. If you are kidnapped in Niger State, you may end up in Zamfara State. And the beginning for ransom will happen from there. If you are kidnapped from Zamfara State, you may end up in Karuna State. And the beginning will happen there. If you are kidnapped from Sokoto or Kebi State, you may end up in Niger State. So this is the way they operate. Uh, bandits are different from terrorists. Not that they operate differently. They have the same strategy, but the, their, their motives are different. And people need to understand this. Terrorists are Boko Haram, they are Iswap, they are Ansaru. These are Islamist religionists that have political agenda of establishing a theocratic state in Nigeria. But the bandits are criminal gangs uh, that are simply motivated by money. We want to, they kidnap to extort ransom and they release their hostages. So a hostage is most likely to be released if it is in the hands of bandits than in the hands of terrorists. Because bandits are local. Negotiations happen locally and they are released locally. But terrorists have a hierarchy of command, some even outside of Nigeria. And they always want to make political gains out of it. The time is going so quickly. <laughs> I feel like I still have so much more to talk with you about. Yeah. State police. You said no. You don't support state police. Well, some people will say that if there is state police in place, you know, we'll be able to check a lot of these movements. You know, there are so many things. Uh, some people have, have pushed for local government autonomy if, and, and better financing for local governments so that local government chairman can be able to be up and doing and tell you when bandits have entered their locality, be able to provide jobs and reduce the poverty levels in those places. But then there's also the issue of state police where people believe that the policemen are from the state and are able to man the activities there and be funded directly from the state then we'll be able to identify these criminals, you know, on time and, and, and make sure that these things don't happen in the first place. But you said no. Why? Well, I have a number of reasons why I'm opposed to state police, and I have no apology for that. And first of all is, do you think that a security problem that has defied solutions from the army and the police and civil defense that have been there for generations, a state police will come with a magic wand and solve it? That is the question. Secondly, states, look at the way they are managing state independent and track commission. Almost all local governments are won by the local, uh, by the ruling parties in those states. That is the way they will manage state police. State police will be used to rig elections. State police will be used to persecute political enemies. State police will be used to go after non-indigenous of those states. State police will be an instrument of persecution at the whims and caprices of a state governor. Nigerian police cannot, a commissioner of police knew very well that he is in between a state governor and IG, and he has to be careful. But a state police is only responsible to the IG. If you ask a commission, if a governor asks a commissioner of police, go and arrest AOB. He has to make sure that he doesn't go beyond his own beat. So, so to me, I can say that why not we increase the number of our policemen and then send them to their state of origin to go and work? I think that will be able to check me those things here. But a police instrument under the control of state governor will be inhabited and populated by supporters of the governors and thugs of the ruling party. And I don't know how that. And in the event of conflict between the federal government and state, the state police will come into open armed confrontation with the federal police. So if you want a state police, we should withdraw a federal police and allow you to deal with your state police. But 
Nigerian police need equipment, need funding, need more training for them to perform their duty. We don't need a state police in Nigeria. Do you have any political plans for the future for yourself? Well, as long as you're alive, you will naturally have, uh, and, and you, have, you have the interest to serve your people and to, to, to do a lot of things for them. You should be in politics. We shouldn't just pull back. Politics is rough. Politics is dirty. Politics is dangerous. But you see, most of the people who survive in politics are people who will stay and defy these odds to attain political power. Good people, gentle people, saintly people, angelic people that are not ready to walk through this rough, stormy, and turbulent path of politics will always be ruled by those who are ready to do that. Are you going to run for any office in the near future? Should we be looking up? And what capacity would you like to serve your people? Because that is what you have mentioned to us right now. As long as you want to serve your people, this is how to do it. How do you intend to serve your people next? Well, it all depends on the way the political calculations come. And are you going to do it under the PRP? Uh, no, um, the PRP now is not in, in the calculation as far as the political structure of Nigeria is concerned, but we have had our time. It was a party we are proud of, of its history, of its struggle, of its ideology. So we are, pro we are PRP in the heart, and we will die PRP in the heart because it's, a, it's an ideology that we share, our parents share, and it has given us, the, it has given the northern masses a direction, a focus. So what party are you moving to? Principle. Well, it all depends on what will happen next, but certainly my party will be announced very soon. You're, you're going to change, you're going to announce your political party soon? Well, of course, I'll announce my political party soon. And maybe tell us what you're going to be running for? Uh, certainly, when the time comes. Well, that's so, something to look forward to. Well, well, you will be informed. Okay. Yes. That's something very exciting. Okay. All right, well... Uh, you know, it's, it's been a lot that has been happening. I don't know where we're going. We, we haven't even scratched the surface of a lot of the things that we wanted to talk about. But, you know, I was reading through a few of your books. I actually uh, decided to take a look at all of them. Killing Fields. Yes. Uh, Killing Fields is a very touching one. Your, your, your foray into the academia, books, poetry, plays. You haven't written in a long time. When are you writing a new why are you writing for us again? Yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book now. But you see, uh, most of the books I wrote were books that I wrote when I was in prison and some when I just came out some few years after imprisonment. Uh, prison is a bad place. But there is something that it does that you can't get it out, is that it gives you a lot of opportunity to think, to write, because you are cut off from the problems, the distractions, and, and the disruptions of the world, and you have enough time to, to put pen on paper and do a lot of work. So I write books. And when I came out, I also write books. But over the years, since I got into politics, a lot of problems come in. You have to deal with political parties, you have to deal with political enemies, you have to deal with your constraints, you have to deal with your friends, your, your problems here and there, and then to put pen on paper. It's a problem. If you look at Wally Schoenker's best book, it was The Man Died. He wrote it in Kaduna Prison during the Civil War. That was a masterpiece. And because he had the composure, the mental stability. But you're, 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 you're writing right now. Though. Right now I'm doing, but it's not easy because I, I put on, each time I pick a pen and paper <laughs> to write, you see, I have to go through my social media handle. <laughs> and then sometimes when you put it by, by the side, then you get a call. And then now when you have family, you have a wife, so you have children, you have so many things. It's not easy for one to write now. Well, here's hoping that the book comes out. Whatever, is it, is it a play? Just give me an idea. Is it a play? I have is a it... play and also I have a complete book on, on the security situation in Northern Nigeria. Ah, that's something to look forward to. But, yes. you know, our time is up, apparently. But I want to thank you very much for being with us on Political Paradigm. And good luck with your book and your play and with all the work you have ahead of you. Thank you very much. We have been speaking with Senator Shea Hussani, former senator representing my place of birth, Kaduna Central Senatorial District. Please join the conversation on ChannelCV.com. Leave your comments there respectfully and join us as we keep asking until the accountability question is answered. I'm Kayla Magua. See you next time.